Right after I, I worked on Mighty Joe Young, I had an idea about Sinbad. I grew up on these pictures where they talked about these creatures off stage, and they were always off stage. And uh, the, the picture ended up being sort of cops and robbers and baggy pants. And uh, I wanted to avoid that. I wanted to include these, these creatures. And that was the beauty about uh, stop motion animation, that you could create this illusion without, uh, uh, in a more convincing way than just dressing up a Greek wrestler as a cyclops. <laughs> so I made these big drawings and took them all over uh, and uh, the, no one seemed interested. RKO had just made a, a film called The Son of Sinbad and it was a costume picture with Lil Sincere. It wasn't a popular picture and uh, the, the, uh, every time I took my drawings, I made eight big drawings of uh, different highlights that the picture could have. And uh, I took them all over to various studios and uh, they all said, costume pictures are dead because this son of Sinbad uh, didn't do very good box office. So I filed them away until Charles and I had made a number of films together of a contemporary nature and uh, brought them out and we finally got the film made. The ship's hold is filled with a giant crossbow. There's no more room. Then lash the arrow to the mast. Aye, aye, Captain. I wrote a, a, about a three or four page outline, a step outline, so that uh, to help sell the project. And uh, the pictures would help, of course, enormously in selling the project. So, but we relied on a, a experienced screenwriter, Ken Cobb they made the final screenplay. And uh, we had several versions of it and finally we came out with the one that Ken Cobb made. We originally wanted to shoot the, the Seventh Voyage of Sinbad in the Middle East, but there was turmoil there as there usually is. And uh, we decided to shoot it in Spain because there, the Arabs were there years ago and there were a lot of dwellings there that were very oriental. So we, we chose Spain and so I was sent to Spain and uh, I met a, a very uh, talented production manager of Spanish, the Spanish film industry and Louis Roberts. And uh, he showed me all the locations that I asked for, a certain type of location. And then we finally flew to, uh, for some locations, to Mallorca, the island of Mallorca. And uh, I made photographs of all these locations. And then when we got back to the studio, uh, I was able to uh, show them to the producer, Charles Schneer. And uh, we decided where to shoot it and formulate how the script should be uh, put together uh, in uh, sections which you shoot in various places, of course. I, I didn't formulate my studio until the last minute because I have to be out on a location during the shooting in order to get the proper reactions from the actors because sometimes they, you tell them that they're looking at a cyclop, so I make these pictures to show them what they're looking at, and then on the set, the actual set, there's just a man there with a pole, a prop man. Uh, the, the creature isn't put in until many months later. So uh, I have to be there on location, so uh, I was all during the shooting actually on location, and I directed many of the scenes that involved the creatures. Kerwin Matthews had a, a good talent of uh, giving the impression that he was actually looking at something. Uh, and that's rather difficult because many times there's nothing there or there's just a man with a pole or even a teapot. But uh, he, he was very talented and we got a, 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 an Italian swordsman who, who taught him how to use the sword in a professional way. and. Uh, then he took the place of the skeleton and we made a, a black and white 
uh, uh, recording of him and Sinbad working out all the various cuts in the picture. I would lay it out roughly in drawings and show it to Enzo Musumeci Greco, who was our swordsman. And uh, then together we would formulate how it was to be photographed. <laughs> Torn Thatcher made a wonderful villain. Uh, of course, I think the, the prime villain that always stuck in my head when I saw the Thief of Baghdad that Corda made in Britain uh, was uh, uh, Conrad Veidt. But Torn Thatcher made a wonderful villain. We had to give him a bald head, so he had to have a, a rubber cap over his hair. He finally got tired of the makeup because he had to come in ahead of time to have this cap properly put on. And uh, he finally shaved his head to, to a bald paint. But that was later on in the film. I long to be free, to be an adventure, to sail the seas as Captain Sinbad does. But those are dreams for real boys, and not for a genie. Richard Eyre was the, the genie of the lamp. But he didn't uh, come about until we, later when we got back to the Columbia Studios in Hollywood. On location, we used a double and uh, a Spanish boy. And uh, we kept his back so he didn't see his face. And then we would substitute wherever it was necessary a uh, close-up of Richard Iyer. And I'd never met him because I was busy putting this together in my studio and uh, uh, I left the live action to Nathan Duran. So he shot the, the live action at the studio, which was uh, in Hollywood, and I had my little studio elsewhere. Some of the directors we had in other films uh, didn't realize they thought I was taking too much on my shoulders. And even one director tried to get me fired. But uh, uh, all in all, I tried to work, be very cooperative. But in order to get what I feel I can put together in an economical way, I have to demand certain angles. And uh, the director like Don Chaffee or uh, Nathan Duran, who were former art directors, they realized this and they would cooperate uh, especially. Well, at the time, I used to be called uh, too coy about not letting people know how it was, things were done. But I always felt that was half the charm when I saw King Kong in 1933. I didn't know how it was done. And uh, I think today they, you see in magazines how things were done before the picture even comes out. And I think that, uh, after all, the people, they're more interested in the technical aspects today than they were then. So I tried to keep it quiet as to how the, this, these various scenes were sh shot. The world has grown very large overnight. It's true. It is you, my darling. My daughter. Where is she? Where is my... Ten thousand. Devils. What evil sorcery is this? The shrinking of, of uh, Catherine Grant, I sh uh, shrunk her down to about, uh, what, three and a half, four inches high. And uh, we did that through Traveling Matt. That was a special process. Traveling Matt is a way of, of putting two pieces of film together by shooting uh, parts of it on a blue backing. Today, with television, they use green screen and various other colors to do inserts and of uh, the backgrounds that may change uh, during the filming of the production. But uh, she was very cooperative, and, and it was a problem of shrinking her down. We had to build big props. We built a 40-foot wide pillow uh, to uh, exactly the way the, the pillow you saw on the bed. Uh, in order to substitute it uh, through matting process uh, to make her look small. So we had to build this 40 foot and about 30 foot high or 25 feet high a pillow. And uh, we had to use a, a stage, sound stage in Sevilla films in Madrid. 
and uh, the camera had to be way back against the wall to make her look small. She had a big plate as well and some grapes and a cork in some later scenes and they all had to be shot in a certain way that, that make her look small. <laughs> very hard to analyze what comprises a typical dragon, but people, you know, in every textbook of, of young people who read these stories of the past, there are different illustrations, and uh, I, you just have to come to some conclusion that, of what the dragon looks like that you saw. I learned that in the early days when I made the fairy tales. I tried to be clever and go to all the schools and see what they wanted in the film. And uh, I got so many different answers, I just decided at that time, and this was before my feature period, that uh, I would make something I liked. So that was my concept of a traditional dragon. <laughs> To make the dragon breathe, I had to put in this little uh, bladder they put in your arm to take your blood pressure. I used one of those, and when I built the dragon, I put the, the Orsat bag inside of him. And then with a tube hanging out, I used the, the, the blow-up to make him look like... But he had to breathe in stop motion. So I had to squeeze the tube just a bit, and then take one frame. Squeeze it again, take another frame squeeze it again while he was in motion and take another frame. So sometimes it takes 24 frames to make him inhale and maybe 12 or 15 frames to exhaust it. So that all takes time, but that's all done in the, the same process during the animation of the creature itself. I've put bladders in most characters. I put one in the Cyclops, but we never used it. Uh, Sometimes there isn't time. I used to blink the eyes a lot, and then nobody ever mentioned it, so I stopped blinking the eyes. <laughs> but I didn't want to stop uh, breathing. I thought the dragon being on his own in the background was very necessary to make him look as real as possible. So I, I was very careful about him looking as though he were breathing where other characters uh, during the action is so violent that you wouldn't notice it anyway, so there was no point in putting it in. Being on a very tight budget, uh, all I was able to do is to have a, a man with a flamethrower when we shot uh, in, in the interior. Uh, we shot against black, which was night at the time we shot it, and he had this uh, flame, and I put the flame in afterwards. <laughs> This is the original skeleton. I made six more for Jason, which was many years later, but I kept the skeleton. He has every joint that a real skeleton would have, so you can animate him. And uh, frame by frame, this is not the original sword, uh, but uh, the, I've lost the original sword. Uh, and this is one of the shields from the, the sequence in uh, Jason and the Argonauts. But uh, skeletons are my best friends. I seem to be identified with them, and, uh, uh, but this skeleton had to be made. It's very difficult to disguise an armature inside a skeleton. So I had to build the armature. My dad built the armature, uh, which is the metal ball and socket joints inside the uh, arm. And uh, then he would uh, send the skeleton to me, and I build up the bones on the actual armature with cotton dipped in latex. And uh, it seems to last quite a while after all these years. I always try to give a slightly demonic look to skeletons because people have that in their mind. Uh, you know, people are afraid of a skeleton. And we all have one inside of us, so they shouldn't be. But uh, that's the way we're built. And uh, so, But I try to give them a, a, a character like uh, slightly demonic eyebrows uh, so that they have a, some sort of character uh, rather than just a, a hollow looking uh, skull. <laughs> The 
famous scene, uh, it finally ended up in the cave on a spiral staircase. My original drawing showed Sinbad driving the skeleton up on the top. Because how do you kill death? That became a problem, you know. And the skeleton had to go up on a height so that when he was pushed off, he broke up into pieces so he couldn't fight anymore. The one that fell off the staircase was an animated model. And then we cut to the bottom of the staircase where we dropped a real skeleton and broke it up in pieces on a rock. I hope this won't destroy the illusions that people may have when they see the film. The Snake Woman came about uh, in my mind when I uh, started de uh, developing the story, and I made sketches of it, and uh, Ken Cobe incorporated it into the script so that it became uh, an act in uh, uh, the Torrin Thatcher performed for the benefit of the Sultans when he was trying to get uh, his boat to go back to the island of Colossa. The snake woman had four arms, and they were built like a snake rather than a, a jointed arm. And uh, the, the four arms would writhe like a snake rather than a bend a joint. I did the same thing with the, uh, the rock in a later sequence. We gave the rock two heads so that he wouldn't look like a normal rock, or people would think it was just a bird put in the picture. But uh, the rock later had two heads, and the baby chick had two heads. We had to account for the eggs in the script. The eggs are on a big scale. So we had this, which is also in one of the Sinbad stories, of this giant egg, which was part of the, uh, uh, the egg of the rock. <laughs> to animate the flying creatures, you have to have a special rig with wires. And the big problem is you're so close to make it look big that uh, sometimes you see the wires. So I had to be very careful that I photographed it in a certain way that you wouldn't see the wires. And uh, sometimes we had to mat them out, sometimes we had to uh, paint them out. Uh, there are various techniques. <laughs> Cyclops is in the actual story of Sinbad uh, in another form. Uh, so I wanted to incorporate the Cyclops. When the picture was released in Britain, uh, I was shocked to see that they'd cut a number of scenes of the Cyclops out because they thought it would frighten children, particularly where he was roasting the man on a spit, which wasn't very nice of him. But uh, that was in the Sinbad story, and we wanted to try to keep it in into the film. To the boats, quickly! We had one with a single horn, which fell off a cliff, and then the second uh, Cyclops fought with the dragon. So I had to make two Cyclops, one a little smaller, so he, he would be proportioned with the dragon. and. Uh, uh, he actually, that was parts of the Emer that we made in, in 20 million miles to Earth. I used the actual skeleton of the Emer. I took his tail off and uh, converted him into a Cyclops. He was just the right size to match the skeleton of the dragon. So I tried to put humanoid features in uh, so that the audience can identify him as a human. The Cyclops is partly human, and the Emer. I, I designed his body. He went through many changes, of course. I designed his body uh, slightly humanoid so that uh, you could get these personal gestures that can communicate with the audience. The live action shots of the close-ups of people were actually shot in Mallorca in the caves of Arta. 
And then, of course, I duplicated the uh, long shots of the cave in miniature when I got back to the studio many weeks later. And uh, you have to, of course, keep it in the same vein as the ones that we found in, in uh, Arta on Mallorca. So uh, that was an after all the, the closer shots were shot in the cave, actual cave. And uh, uh, the long shots were shot late, many weeks later in the studio in a miniature. And they had to be combined in such a way that you're not aware of that. The basic process of dynamation was uh, using rear miniature rear projection. And when you project an image in color uh, and rephotograph it, many times the light of the projector will change the value of the colors on the screen. So, it, and you find it difficult to match uh, the close ups on the original material. So, that becomes a problem which you have to compensate for finally. But uh, we finally mastered that after there was a bigger variety of, uh, of uh, film stock. But at the time we were using it, we only had one film stock in color. And uh, we had to work with that uh, very carefully so that it would intercut with the original material. And uh, so we had to make a lot of tests in the early days to be sure we could match the long shots with the close-ups. Originally, I wanted to make it as lavish as the Thief of Baghdad that Alexander Korda made. But uh, nobody would put up that kind of money, particularly in Hollywood. So uh, I, uh, I had to modify it so we could do it on a, a very tight budget. I never kept track of how much time the animation would take, uh, but uh, the live action was on a very tight budget. And uh, the animation was just myself involved and sometimes with an electrician. So uh, I've never kept track of it because if I did, I'd probably avoid it. <laughs> I'm grateful to see that after 50 years, our pictures have lasted where some of the so-called A pictures have fallen by the wayside.